for his word. Well, a woman went to the eyeglass counter with a pair of eyeglasses that she wanted to return. And as was the policy of the company, the attendant said, well, why do you want to return these glasses? And she said, well, I got them for my husband. But even though he wears them, he doesn't see things the way I want him to. Don't you like people to see things the way you see them? I do. You know I do, don't you? (laughs) But expecting people to see things our way always can lead to some hard problems. It can lead to some painful issues in our lives. It can lead to broken relationships. You might think that you spoke clearly and precisely, but that's not what they heard, especially with these masks, right? It can be really hard. But even before masks, You might think that you spoke in a kind and compassionate tone. This is something I'm guilty of. But if we were to record you on our phones, you might sound a little different than you expected, right? One time I had a confirmation class um, that I had two best friends, a boy and a girl, and um, they had been best friends most of their lives because they grew up in the church and in this small community, and they were just best buds. They did lots of things together. They were both musical. They just had a lot of interest. But one day in confirmation class, an odd thing happened. They started bickering with each other, and then things got really ugly, So I knew it was an opportunity to teach on forgiveness. So I stopped the class and I made them each apologize to each other and say, I forgive you. And I told them when they did this that they had to do it sincerely. (laughs) Yeah, that was a little bit of a stretch. But the boy did it first because he was the last one to say the most hurtful thing, I thought. And he said he was sorry And I had the girl say, I forgive you. And then I had the girl apologize, I'm sorry. And I had him say, I forgive you. Why? Well, because saying the words, I'm sorry, and I forgive you are powerful. They're powerful in our minds, and they're powerful in our relationships. Even when we don't say them necessarily as sincerely as we might, they move us a step forward in being the people that God wants us to be. Now, when you've committed a sin, saying you're sorry is important for both the person that you sinned against and for you. It's important for you to admit when you do things wrong. It's important for us to say we're sorry. But simply saying I'm sorry is a powerful tool, but that's the key. Saying it simply. Maybe you've been like me and you are sorry kind of, or maybe you have reasons, but you start into your sorry, your apology to someone, you finally worked yourself up to do it, and it keeps going. Your sorry keeps going, and your story keeps going, and as you listen to it, if you were to play it back on on your phone, you would find out that more as you got towards the end of it, you were rationalizing why everything happened, and really, when you really got to the end of it, you were kind of blaming the other person. Have you ever told a sorry like that? I have, or maybe you've had it told to you. Again, saying sorry simply and sincerely is key to relationship healing. And it's key for relationships healing for you. But you may not have that privilege. The person saying they're sorry may do what I just said. They may go on and on, and you wonder if they're sorry at all. But when you say you're sorry, you need to mean it. And you need to say it to the one you have wronged. That's so important. When you know you've done something or you find out you've done something, you need to go to that person and tell them you're sorry. Now, how they respond and react, that's up to them. That's not your responsibility. And one thing they might want to do, they might want to know why. Why did you act this way? Why did you do that? And that can be a really hard question to answer, can it? It's a common human response to pain to want to know why. But often understanding why things happen is much more complex than we realize. You might have to do some hard talking if you're the one who's done the wrong about your your in what your own needs are or what your own thinking is or you might come up to be like the apostle paul in romans 
The Apostle Paul in Romans said, I, Romans chapter 7, I don't know why I do what I don't want to do and why I can't manage to do what I want to do. You may be like my nephew. My nephew Eli is uh, in uh, the U of I. He's an engineering student. He's doing good, and we're so proud of him. So he's a growing, he's a man now, a young man, and it's hard for me to imagine. But when he was about 10 or 11, you know, a great age, we, we'd have him come for what we called Camp Spa Arnold. <laughs> Because he, he wasn't an outdoors person, so we did a lot of spa things, went to the pool and did fun things like that. But he was acting kind of ornery. Normally, he was very compliant, a lot of fun to be around. He was articulate, so we loved visiting with him. But he was being kind of ornery one day, and, and he wouldn't stop. You know, he was being kind of ornery. And so I just kind of jokingly said, why are you being so bad? It wasn't language we normally use, but I was like, why are you being so bad? And he was such a thinker that he stopped for a moment, and he thought about it, and he looked me straight in the eye, and he said, I like being bad. <laughs> right? I like being bad. And that often <laughs> can be our, ex our excuse. You know, we don't realize it deep inside. We don't want to hurt the other person, but we kind of like being bad. <laughs> we like being ornery. We like doing things. And, you know, the Apostle Paul agreed that happens. Uh, it happens because until we're in glory, our old sinful nature will hang on. This is, this is from Match.com. I don't know if any of you saw this. This is the devil and year 2020. Did you ever? No, you didn't get that either. Okay, never mind. We'll move on. You know, those were the match made together. Who could meet with the devil? Well, year 2020 was his match. <laughs> because it was like a bad year. But anyway, you know, you might not be sorry about things you've done and let, except that you got caught. Have you ever had a situation like that? I have. Sometimes I haven't been sorry. I, I like, like my nephew. There are times in my life where I've liked being bad. And otherwise, I might not, if I hadn't got caught, if I hadn't been confronted about it, I might never really been sorry about it. But to grow beyond that attitude... Because that's what it needs. We need to grow spiritually into our own maturity so that we can know the joy of doing good. Not to avoid punishment. <laughs> you know, we sometimes like to do good to avoid punishment. No, that's not what we're talking about. There's a joy of doing good as a Christian that comes when we're more emotional and spiritually mature. The Lord gladly will lead us on a journey to maturity if we're willing to go. But it's a hard journey. It takes some uncomfortable corners sometimes to look at yourself in the face. And, and if you're willing to take that journey, though, you become a person who can easily, sincerely say you're sorry and mean it. Not to just get out of an uncomfortable situation, but because you love the other person. Because you love God. Because you, want, you don't want to hurt another person. You, you find when you grow in your maturity as a Christian, you might be saying sorry less. Sure, you might have to say it a lot more at the beginning. But then you might say, find you're saying it less. Why? Because you're more thoughtful about the other person. You're less likely to do things that might be offensive. I'm so thankful that I have been growing up as a Christian. It's taken a long time, but that I don't have to apologize to people so much. When my, fortunately, we don't have conference meetings as much, but I was notorious for just saying mean things, blunt things that were offensive to others. I didn't realize it at the time, but now I think you don't have to say that, Mary. You can keep that thought to yourself. You don't have to squirt it out <laughs> and then let Jesus have it. You don't have to say it to others. And that's when we know we're more mature. But until then, we might be like this. We might say, just get over it. What are you so upset about? <laughs> you know, we think they should get over it. That wasn't that bad. Well, you know, friends, that may be true for you. Maybe you did something and it wasn't that bad for you. And maybe it really wasn't like if all of us were evaluating, is this a super bad thing or is this not a super bad thing? We might all say, no, that wasn't that bad of a thing. It's irrelevant. It was bad to them. That's what matters because it might be the day 
when they've had everything go wrong, like my friend was talking about how she just had a day where she was walking in uh, to her dining room from her kitchen after she heated her food and she stumbled or something and her food went all over the place. And she just said, I just sat down and started crying. Now, spilling food isn't that big of a deal. She was, it was fortunately on, on cleanable flooring. It wasn't carpet or anything. But it's just, that was just the top of the, you know, just the tipping point. And that may be if we say something that's just a little smarty or whatever, it might be the tipping point for that person. Maybe our tone was different than what we expected. That's what I had to learn when I got married. My tone wasn't so great. It wasn't that what I was saying was such a horrible thing, but how, why was I saying it with that mean tone? I didn't even know I had a mean tone <laughs> until I tried to live with someone else, and then I found out, mm, I do have a mean tone <laughs> or a bossy tone or whatever it is. You know, it's, when you, it's much different when you hear it for yourself. And if, if you have someone in your life that might say, you speak harshly to me, and you don't believe them, I don't speak harshly to you. Get over it. Then an, a, a thing you might want to do is take your phone and tape your, you know, and record yourself. I know it seems awkward, but I had, I've had, uh, I don't do much counseling because I don't have time. I'm not that trained and whatever, but um, I think people should go see professionals. But um, I, when I was early in my ministry, I did a little bit, and I had a couple come in, and they were arguing. And I, while they were t- sitting with me, I could hear how hostile they were talking to each other. And I, I said to them, you know, I think you're not speaking that nicely to each other. However, I said it probably meanly, <laughs> because in those days, I didn't care how I always talked. And um, they, did, they denied it. They didn't believe it. Or they pointed, well, yeah, so you know, she's doing speaking mean, but I'm not. And He's speaking mean, but I'm not. So I took out my, uh, those days you had to use a tape recorder. And I recorded him at the next meeting and I played it back for him and they couldn't believe it. They could not believe how they sounded. And so I think that might be true for all of us, that we need to listen. How are we saying things? You know, people don't want to hold on to pain. You think people don't want to get over things? They do want to get over it. But we might need to help them. We might need to help them by first apologizing and encouraging them. Or maybe we're not even involved in it, but we need to encourage them to to let things go. We need to be sympathetic and empathetic, not just saying, just get over it. Buck up. In our family, it used to be just say, you know, you're too thin-skinned. You're too thin-skinned. Have you heard that before? Yeah. Well, no. It's okay. That. If you're the one who's done the wrong, it doesn't matter if they're too thin-skinned. You are the one who needs to say, sincerely, I'm sorry. I love you. I, don't, I want to help you get over this, but I'm not going to say the word get over it. I'm simply going to say, yeah, that would hurt. That's how you help people get over things. You say, yeah, that would hurt. Why do you think Jesus was so attractive? When he was, was he super good looking is why people were, mag, you know, drawn to him like a magnet. And who was drawn to him? The lost, the broken, the hurt people. Why do you think they were so drawn to him? Because he was compassionate towards them. He was sympathetic towards them. He didn't blame them for the, the situations they were in. He showed compassion to them. And that's what helps people get over things. People get over things when we are sorry, (laughs) when we show that we're sorry and we convey it sincerely. Now, there are times when it's not going to be easy for us and maybe we really don't think we've done something wrong. I've had times like that and I've said, I'm sorry. Now, my husband has caught me once when I was, he's heard, you know, I was preaching about certain things years ago, and he said, well, I thought you said people shouldn't just say they're sorry all the time, you know, and I do agree that there, you know, certain people are always saying I'm sorry, and they need lifted up because, you know, they are sincerely sorry, but they have nothing to be sorry for, right? Do you know people like that? I've known people like that, and they need to be lifted up. 
but not most of us. Most of us need to be encouraged to say sorry more. And he said, well, what are you, you, you haven't done anything wrong here. Why are you saying this? you're sorry? It has nothing to do with you when he was telling me about some problems at a different church or whatever. And I said, I'm sorry because I don't really want to have to hear all this or get involved in all this. <laughs> now, then I really had to apologize. <laughs> I'm sorry because I'm dealing with this. Sometimes that's why I say I'm sorry. So if I say I'm sorry to you, you better hope I mean what I'm saying. <laughs> no, I do. And saying it sincerely is so important. You know, if, if you've noticed a relationship has changed in your life, that's the time to explore that maybe you need to say you're sorry. Is something different? Pay attention. Have you not heard from that person as much? Did, you know, has something happened? Now, people get busy, of course. But, but, you know, take the initiative to find out or a person might drift away. You know, but the question asked, do you think you might have hurt them? You know, we hear things so differently. Everyone hears things so differently, and communication can be so hard. But did you hurt them? Well, then, you know, try to say, look, I, I don't, it seems like something's happened in our relationship. Have I hurt your feelings? If I have, what happened? I'm very sorry. I want to make it right. I want to, I'm, I want to try to help make this right. And apology sometimes is all that's needed. Most of the time, that's all that's needed. A sincere apology will heal a lot of wounding. But sometimes you might have to do more. Sometimes you might have to make restitution if, if you've done it. And again, saying I'm sorry and saying I forgive you is so important. And maybe someone's wronged you. Maybe someone's wronged you and you have to say I forgive you. That is so important. And I would say, if you've had someone where you're saying, you have to say you're sorry to, ask them to say, could you please tell me that you forgive me? Could you please say that to me? That is so powerful. I forgive you. You know, that's one thing I love about, about when I do a prayer of confession. I love hearing, you are forgiven in Jesus' name. It's so powerful for me. It's so releasing to me. It helps me change and know that I'm in a right relationship with God. And that works the same for us. Saying, I'm sorry, and saying, I forgive you, heals our heart. Because what happens? We're hurt. You know, if someone has hurt us, someone has hurt us, and they need to, maybe they need to say sorry for us, sorry, sorry to us, but maybe they don't even know it. I had a person at a church a few years ago, because I preached about forgiveness before, and I said that. I said, you know, I was just talking, I said, you know, maybe the person doesn't even know that you've wrong that they that you've that you're offended by them or you've gotten hurt by what they said. They might not even know. You need to tell them. And you know, people just kind of take that with a shrug or whatever, but it's true. You think people know, but they don't know. They're not paying attention. They didn't mean to hurt. And so you, you're the one who needs a Band-Aid. When we're hurt, we need Band-Aids on our hearts. And so maybe you're the one that needs to tell them. The Bible says, go to someone if you have something separating you. It's our responsibility to reach out. And forgiveness means what? Forgiveness means sending the hurt away. Now, if you're carrying a bunch of hurt around because you need to forgive people, then, then you are getting your insides like what Stacy described. You're filling up your heart with a bunch of stuff. And then you are the one who needs to repent of that. You haven't done the wrong, but if you're holding on to the wrong, you are the one who needs to say sorry to God for that. That's not how God wants you to live. Jesus said, if we forgive others, then our Heavenly Father will forgive us. And forgiveness starts by us letting it go. Now, it doesn't again mean that you're saying what they did was right. God knows what they did wasn't right. But it says you're not going to let it continually wound you. That you're going to put a Band-Aid on it. I have a little cut on my finger. And, you know, it, gets, it hurts, doesn't it? Those little bitty cuts. And if I don't take care of it, if I don't put a Band-Aid on it, it'll get worse, won't it? And it'll just irritate me and cause me to be grouchy. And that's true for wounds in our hearts. 
And little wounds, we need to start trying to work on the little wounds and forgiving them and letting them go. Not because it, the other person deserves it. They don't deserve it. Forgiveness is about mercy. It's not about that they deserve it. No, it's you who deserve to be free. You're the one who deserves to be free from this pain. You don't need to be carrying this pain around anymore. You can let the Lord have it. Now, maybe you have a big pain. And you know what I found about unforgiveness? It's kind of like what Stacy showed there. It grows. It just keeps growing. Maybe you didn't forgive someone because they offended you. They didn't like your political party that you wanted to, them to like. <laughs> that was a big thing just a couple of years ago. Maybe they don't like whatever. Maybe they didn't like your outfit. Who knows? They hurt your feelings. And you're holding on to that. Instead of forgiving them. Now, then, next thing you know, it's kind of like a magnet. And all sorts of things are starting to offend you and hurt you. And you're grouchy all the time. And now you're hurting other people. Is that how God wants you to live in Jesus Christ? No. Or maybe you do have a big wound. Maybe someone did betray you terribly. That happens. We know. And you'll see that it, it starts attracting these little things. And... I would say to start working on healing that big thing, you need to heal little things. You need to forgive little things. You need to say to people, I forgive you. And maybe they haven't even said they're sorry. <laughs> wouldn't it be funny if someone came up to you and said, I forgive you? You'd want to know what it was about, wouldn't you? <laughs> I would. And that would start healing a relationship. It would help the person like me, you know, I go around bluntly saying things, oh, this and that. And I don't pay, you know, I don't listen to half of what I say, unfortunately. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> and I'd be like, I didn't say, what? And the, but then I could th look at that person and now I look at the person and I see, wow, that did hurt them. And I need to apologize. I need to say I'm sorry and ask them to forgive me. And if people do it to me, then I need to say to them, I forgive you. I'm going to let that go. I've decided I'm not going to hang on to pebbles in my life. I, I'm going to be like a deck with water going out my back sometimes. Some things hurt more than others. But a lot of things I've decided, just let it go. Being a minister helps you learn that quickly. If you take everything that people say and get offense about it, you're going to be a grouchy person most of the time. And I don't want to live that way. I want to live free. But... Again, I can only do that if I forgive people. I can only do that if I put that pain away from me. And when I do that, it's not saying what they did is right. No, it's not. What they did is not right. Even if, if it was something kind of silly, it's not right if my feelings got hurt. You know, I need to be in a right relationship with them. It, I need to forgive them because Jesus has forgiven me. And that's what it, repentance and forgiveness is all about. It removes these it's like putting a Band-Aid on and letting our hearts heal. It helps us get in a right relationship. And that's the wonderful thing. That's why Ash Wednesday is one of my favorite celebrations out throughout the whole year because it gives me such a time to really say, like I was working on a really, I've been working on one for three years, someone offended me. And they are not going to say they're sorry. In fact, they don't think, I, they think I'm a baby because I got offended. And I probably am, but too bad. I'm offended, <laughs> right? And I had to heal, but I'm the one carrying that around. I'm carrying this big bag of, uh, uh, around, and I'm sick of it. Every Ash Wednesday, I put that name down on my thing. Every Ash Wednesday, I burn it. Every Ash Wednesday, for three years, I kept saying, I've got to let it go, and I feel like I'm getting closer. Not quite there yet, but I'm getting closer. And that's what we have to challenge ourselves when we have big wounds. But it starts by healing little wounds. It starts by saying, I'm sorry, and I forgive you. Those can be the sweetest words we hear. I forgive you. And the hardest ones to say. I forgive you. Let's practice saying those two phrases. We said at the beginning of our Lenten journey to tell God, I love you, and thank you, God. And some of us, that's a hard thing to say. But how about saying, I'm sorry, and I forgive you? Try to say that with me. I'm sorry, I forgive you. Yeah. And try to say that to other people. And next time, we're going to talk about trying to say it 
to ourselves. God's will for us in Jesus Christ, friends, is that we live free, that we don't live with the burden of pain that we're carrying around because of unforgiveness or of not repenting, but mostly unforgiveness we carry around where we don't forgive other people. Jesus talked about that more than anything else, our need to forgive. And how many times did Jesus tell the disciples that he needed to forgive someone? One time? Seven times? Seventy times seven. A huge amount. One person. One person who kept wronging you had to forgive him that much. And so the disciples soon afterwards said, how could anyone live like that? And Jesus said, with people it's impossible. With God... All things are possible. So live free today. Live in God's love for you in Jesus Christ. And most importantly, share God's love for you with others in Jesus Christ. By saying, I love you, I'm sorry, and I forgive you. Amen? Amen.